In 1954, 15-year-old Diane Hank of Portland, Oregon was out to make some extra money. Babysitting was the occupation of choice for junior high school girls during the mid-late 20th century. At an age when no business would hire you, it was nice to have a way to make a few extra dollars for yourself. It was a safe, family-oriented job. Wholesome. You'd get a neighbor's fancy home all to yourself for the evening while you played with their cute babies. So when Diane met Sherry and Wei Him Fong, she was excited to have a regular gig. She never expected to get caught up in a world of secrets, narcotics, and organized crime. This week on Out of the Past, the murder of Diane Hank and the Fong trials. Diane had purchased a shirt as a Christmas gift for Wei Him, who went by Wayne, but she still hadn't given him nearly a week into the new year. She called Mrs. Fong to ask what to do about it, and Sherry told her to bring it by. Sherry invited Diane to stay for dinner and told her to ask her mother for permission. Diane's mother allowed her to go. The Fongs, Diane, and a couple named Smalley all had pre-dinner drinks together with the children asleep in the next room. The Smalleys didn't stay for dinner, and they were the last people, other than the Fongs, ever to see Diane alive. Two people spoke to Diane on the telephone before her disappearance. First, her friend Anne Encontro, who called her there at the Fong residence. She told authorities Diane said they were having a party and that she was high. After that call, Diane phoned her mother, telling her that her hair was up in pin curls and she would be home soon. A little while later, she called her mother again, telling her Mr. Fong still hadn't returned and she had no way of getting home. Mrs. Hank told her daughter it might be best for her to spend the night there. Diane agreed. Mrs. Hank never saw her daughter alive again. The police were on the case immediately. The community refused to let a beautiful blonde teenage girl go missing. Unfortunately, as information came out that could help community members search for Diane, information about Diane also leaked that caused some neighbors to change their opinion of her. For example, she had recently had a baby out of wedlock. Gossip also abounded that she had smoked marijuana. Some people initially eager to help her took away their support. But most were still heartbroken over the striking six-foot-tall teenager's disappearance. People who hadn't known her learned things about her from those who had. She was shy, smart, and always willing to help others. Unfortunately, all search efforts were fruitless. People did not hesitate to make assumptions, though. She was last seen at the Fongs. Mr. Fong was known to deal in shady business, not to mention he was married to a white woman, and many people didn't trust mixed-race couples. Investigators believed that the Fongs had morally corrupted the teenager. A decision was made to go after Sherry first, as she seemed to be the most likely to crack. At one point, Sherry placed a personals ad in the Portland Oregonian which read, Diane, please contact me. Regardless of your present circumstances or anything you may have done, I'll help you all I can. Sherry. This could either have been a ruse on Sherry's part to appear innocent or a genuine gesture of concern. By all accounts, Sherry and Diane's relationship was a close one. They were practically attached at the hip. According to Diane's sister, the two frequently borrowed each other's clothes, and Sherry had been there for Diane throughout her unplanned pregnancy. I mentioned earlier that Diane had taken up skiing shortly before her disappearance. Sherry had bought her an expensive ski jacket for Christmas. Numerous reports and accusations clouded the way to clear answers in this case. An undercover officer was reported to have remarked to someone that the Fongs were getting a dirty deal, and the cops were just trying to pin the case on somebody so they could get rid of it. 
One of Diane's Lincoln High classmates claimed to have seen her downtown the day after her disappearance. Another classmate said she ran into Diane at Meyer and Frigg department store a couple of weeks later. The defense accused the prosecutors of dismissing these reports because they didn't fit the case they were arguing. Diane's own boyfriend, Kenneth Martin, who was the father of her child, was reported to have told her that he would kill her if he ever saw her with another boy. And this was very emotionally upsetting to her. According to Sherry, Diane was distraught to the point of being suicidal over her relationship problems. Sherry said that Diane told her, If he stands me up again, I'll kill myself. It was also rumored that Sherry had told the bartender her girlfriend had killed herself, and that she told the police Diane contributed perhaps 75% to her own death. Whatever that means. Wayne Fong attempted to cast suspicion on the Smalleys, the couple who had shown up at the Fong's house the night of the 6th. The Smalleys were alleged brothel operators. Most of this information was impossible to establish as anything other than hearsay. At any rate, it wasn't long before a gruesome discovery was made. Diane's body was found on February 27th atop a steep hill on the south side of Evergreen Highway in Clark County, Washington, wrapped in two blankets and a sheet tied up with rope. She was wearing the same clothing she wore the night of January 6th when she had gone to the Fongs for dinner. Her bra was pulled up above her breasts, but the rest of her clothing fit normally. Interrogators questioned Sherry Fong for an inhumane amount of time without breaks. Even after 16 hours, Sherry provided them with no information. Law enforcement had to try different strategies, at one point setting up a sting operation at a hotel where they tried to eavesdrop on a conversation she was having with a friend in the next room. The friend, in cahoots with the police, tried to get her to confess to Diane's murder. Sherry did no such thing. Sherry claimed the police drugged her during this operation, which the police denied. Despite Sherry's lack of cooperation, the grand jury indicted both her and Wayne based almost entirely on circumstantial evidence. A third person, Kwong Ting Yi, was also indicted. Yi is described in most of the newspaper accounts from the time as a frequent house guest of the Fongs. His exact relation to them is unclear, though given the context, it's likely that he was in the narcotics business with Wayne. Sherry and Wayne were tried together in the first trial and found guilty. The jury voted 10 to 2 to sentence them to die in the gas chamber. The judge, however, overturned the verdict, asserting the prosecution had failed to provide anything more than circumstantial evidence. An overflow of information came out in the subsequent retrials. Information that perhaps would have kept Diane alive had she known about it before she took the babysitting gig. The Fongs were heavily involved in the Portland drug scene. Wei Him Fong was an important leader in his organization. It was the state's position that Diane was killed because she knew too much about the Fongs' black market operation. One key witness, Mrs. Smalley, of the couple who had drinks but didn't stay for dinner, and who were later cast into suspicion by Wayne, testified that by the time she left, Diane had already had a couple of martinis and was acting silly. Some sources report she had as many as five martinis that night. The prosecution used this information in an attempt to show how irresponsibly the thongs had behaved around a 15-year-old girl, and it seems pretty compelling. This was a child who was obviously hurting and trying to self-medicate and the Fongs had no problem helping her do that. In fact, the Fongs gave Diane a lot more than alcohol. They were drug dealers, after all. Sherry had also given her vitamins. Authorities found a bottle in her jumper with pills inside, and a typed note that said, Diane, take one daily. Sherry insisted that these were vitamins, B12 and Theragrin M. There is a lot of talk, even today, about the directions that were found with the bottle. The word Diane 
and the rest of the text were written on completely different typewriters from each other. How? What happened? Were the Fongs trying to alter the directions? This is still a bit of a mystery. Sherry insisted that none of the vitamins were poisonous, and toxicology reports were largely inconclusive. Tests showed that Diane had half a milligram of barbital in 100 milligrams of her liver. Her death was determined to be an OD with a mix of barbital and alcohol poisoning. The two drugs worked together to depress the central nervous system. There was some disagreement, though, among medical examiners if she actually had enough barbital in her system to be poisoned, but these doctors don't provide an alternative cause of death for Diane. Diane had no prescription for barbiturates at the time of her death. So we know that the Fongs dealt in illegal narcotics. We also know that they gave Diane alcohol, vitamins, and other substances. My gut tells me this was a murder by poisoning. In my opinion, probably at the hands of Wayne, at the request of the Syndicate. Some have argued that she could have overdosed on her own, taking her own life either accidentally or on purpose. If she overdosed and it was accidental, it seems apparent that the Fongs wanted to cover it up in order to avoid suspicion. This was not a cut-and-dry case where the state was able to prosecute, convict, and sentence. Though Sherry Fong's attempts to play on the jury's heartstrings were not always successful, the evidence was weak and almost entirely circumstantial. Sherry was tried twice before 1957, and mistrials were declared both times. She was finally convicted during her third trial, with some disturbing details emerging during the process. One of the most damning pieces of evidence was a conversation Sherry was said to have had with a planted police informant. She told the informant that the Chinese syndicate had in fact wanted Diane killed because they felt she was talking too much. Sherry claimed that she had herself offered to pay as much as $125,000 to get them to leave the girl alone. Again, as with the personals ad, this could have been a ploy to appear sympathetic or an honest statement, assuming she ever said it at all. On Wayne's side, evidence emerged that he had tried to off two witnesses that would have been damning in his case. Pio King Kong Rego, a Filipino immigrant employed by the Fongs, testified about the culture of fear and how important it was to stay quiet. In one newspaper, I read that Pio Rego testified in broken English that he'd helped Wayne move a body at some point. I don't know if this was supposed to be Diane's body or if this statement was even true. There's also a language barrier to take into consideration. Organized crime bigwigs like Jimmy Valentine and Honey Luttrell were forced to testify. Addicts who were very involved in the underground opium scene. After Sherry Fong's third trial, she was convicted of second-degree murder. That appeal went all the way to the Supreme Court, and after her fourth trial, Sherry Fong was acquitted. It was over. She couldn't be tried again. According to the U.S. government, she was not guilty, no matter what had actually happened. Wayne's legal journey was similar to his wife's, and ended up a free man just about the time she did. Things went well for the Fongs for a short time after that, but law enforcement took Wayne into custody again in 1958 for possession of heroin. He was sentenced to 20 years, but only served 12. After being paroled, he moved back to Portland and became Chinatown's biggest drug dealer. There's a lesson here about prison not being a deterrent. Sherry, on the other hand, tried to stay under the radar after her release. She died in 1987 at the age of 56. A lot of attention was given to the scandalous interracial couple in this case. The legal proceedings went on for years, and ultimately they couldn't stick the crime on the Fongs. People became more familiar with the Fong name than Diane's. She faded into the background as her alleged assailants took the spotlight. 
Diane was a very young woman whose life was ended before it ever truly began. She left behind an infant who would never know her real mother or how much she cared for her. Diane was smart, and we have no idea what she could have accomplished if her life wasn't cut so short. I'm also curious as to whether she was being abused or suffering from depression. Five martinis in a night is enough to make a grown man pass out, and reading about it, it didn't seem like an unusual thing for Diane to do. I believe she was self-medicating. The question is why? Were the Fongs abusing her more than we even suspect? Was it problems with her boyfriend? Was something going on at home? We'll never know. We can go on and on about the specific details of this case, but the truth of the matter is this. For many years, our culture has been comfortable with the idea of junior high and high school girls working as babysitters. We need to take a step back and think about how dangerous this practice is. For example, if a customer wanted to hire a member of the fictional book series, The Babysitter's Club, all the person would have to do is call the number on the flyer and a young girl would show up at the date and time requested. Remember, for decades, girls have been doing this for families they don't know. 13 or 14 year old girls showing up on a stranger's doorstep, all alone, ready to come inside. When I babysat in middle school, my parents always made sure they knew the family I was sitting for very well. But even with families looking out for their kids like this, bad things can still happen. You have to remember, you don't ever really know your neighbors or even your close friends. Obviously, you can't hold on to your child forever, never taking your eyes off them. But the 20th century babysitting model is too dangerous to both the babysitter and the child. I'm sure Diane's parents had no idea they were letting their daughter into a drug den when they sent her to babysit for the Fongs. All too often, we expect the best of people, but we need to remember that that's how predators sneak their way in. If you want to make a difference in the life of someone who's been affected by the kind of events we talk about on this channel, visit my website where there's a list of reputable charities that could really use your donation. That's all for this week. I'll see you next time on Out of the Past. Stay safe.